Lectures in Systematic Theology by Thiessen. We're on page 166, right at the bottom of the page. In our study, we're talking about creation. Creation versus evolution. Creation versus evolution. He said, we cannot enter any, any detailed discussion of the merits of the theistic evolution theory at this point, but shall do this briefly in connection with our study of the creation of man. Suffice it to say here that the theory rests upon the basis of a mechanistic worldview, a mechanical worldview. We are glad to note that some of the best scientists still maintain that evolution must be regarded as a mere hypothesis, but that's not what they're teaching in our schools. They're teaching evolution in our schools today. This book was written probably 50 years ago. And uh, evolution takes more faith to believe in evolution than it does in creation because mathematically all the odds are against evolution. There has to be a creator. Scientifically, and mathematically. As an assumption, not as a fact, they hold that there is not sufficient evidence to prove that it is a fact. And if the best scientists say this, then it is not necessary for us to adopt the theistic evolutionary view. It's not, it, it's not necessary for us to adopt a theistic evolutionary theory because it is not the Bible. The Bible doesn't teach that. If the Bible taught evolution, I would believe it, but it does not. Now, I've heard rabbis, I've heard different people talk about theistic evolution. When I was in high school, my teacher believed in God, but he believed that God created only the origin of all things and that things did evolve. I do not believe that. That's what I was taught. My stepfather, Dale, taught me that uh, atheism was the way that there was no way that you can believe in God. He did not believe in God. He believed, He said that there was no one that could prove that there is a God. Well, when my grandmother got killed, I felt very, very much alone. I had nobody left in the world that loved me and that would care for me. And I was only just turned 13 years old. And I, be I, I began to go to church where she had taken me and heard the preaching there, but it was not. It was charismatic, all charismatic, nothing else. They did not preach the Bible. They did not teach the Bible, but they did make a mistake and gave me a Bible. And I read the whole thing, and I was miserable until I got to the New Testament. And I read it in a hurry. I just read and read and read. All I did was see condemnation of my life. And I was young. I hadn't really done anything wrong. But it was just condemnation. I went to church. While they were preaching, I went down to the altar. My ex-step-grandmother went down there with me, taught me what to say. And I asked the Lord to save my soul, and the Lord has been watching over me ever since, even though I have not been doing the right thing all the time. But I can see God's hand on me every day of my life since that time. God is loving. He is gracious. And yet, there is a hell there is correction for us when we do wrong. I know that. A child of God cannot go the way of the world because if he does, he's not going to be happy. We look at the scriptures. We're studying this because it says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We're studying systematic theology so that we'll understand what the Bible teaches in a systematic, logical way. Let's go on down here. This is class number 38. Other biblical proofs of creation. 
There are many other scriptures that teach the doctrine of creation. A few of them speak of the original creation of the heavenly and earth, Isaiah 40 and verse 26 and 45, 18. Isaiah 40. Let's look at those. We don't usually go and chase all of these rabbits all the time, but let's look at Isaiah. <coughs> Isaiah, the 40th chapter, verses 26. I've got to take this Bible and rip this cover off of it and put another one on it. It's falling apart. 40 and 26. Do you have that, Sharon? All right. Lift up your eyes on high and see who has created the stars. The one who leads forth their host, their armies by number, and he calls them all by name. Because of the greatness of his might and the strength of his power, no one of them is missing. Not one of them is missing. Now, let's look at 4518 and see what 4518 says. Thus saith the Lord who created the heavens. He is the God who formed the earth and made it. He established it and did not create it in what? Tohu wavohu. Now Genesis 1 and 1 says, Barashith bara Elohim eth Hashemayim we eth arts. In beginnings, in one of the beginnings, he had created God, the heavens and the earth. And he created the heavens, which is the universe. Then he put the earth in exactly the right place. Exactly where it would sustain life, where he could... The earth is not the center of the universe, as the Catholic Church taught. And the earth is not flat, as the Catholic Church taught. The earth is not the center of the universe, but it is the center of the universe when it talks about redemption, because the Redeemer came here. And he came here. In Genesis 1 and 2, it says, We ha'aris, hathiatuhu, wuhu, we hoshok el panehamayim. It says, and the earth she had become formless and void. Tohu wavohu. And then it says, and there was darkness over the deep. And then it says, Ruah Elihim Meripacheth El Panehamayim. And then it says, and Spirit God, the Holy Spirit, suffered over the chaos of the deep. And then he began his immediate creation, recreation of the earth. Immediate means, that's Genesis 1 and 1. Immediate creation is when he took the earth and put it back into form. Like us, we're born in sin. We're born in sin. And then God, through his spirit, rebuilds us, rebuilds our lives. For thus saith the Lord who created the heavens and the earth, he is the one who formed the earth and made it. He established it and did not create it a wasteland. Look at the Jewish Publication Society. They believe in God created chaos and brought out a chaos order. God does not create chaos. He creates order. He created not in chaos, in waste, and formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord. There is none else. By the way, there's only one Lord, and that's our Savior, Jesus Christ. He is one Lord, and there is no one else. Let's go on. We looked at that a little bit. A good number of them speak of God creating all men. Psalm 102 and verse 18 and 139 and verse 13 through 16. Isaiah 43, 1 through 7 and 54, 16. Ezekiel 21, 30. Most of them represent the God as a creator of heaven and earth and all things therein. Genesis 1 and John 1 and Colossians 1 are almost juxtaposition doctrinal issues that God created. And Jesus is the one that created all the earth and he's the one that holds it all together. Isaiah 43, 5, 45, 12, John 1 and 3, see what I said? Acts 17, 24, Romans 11, 36, 
Ephesians 3 and 9 and Colossians 1, 16, Revelation 4 and 11. Why did God create all things? Because he wanted to. It was his, vol his volition, his sovereign right to create all things, to bring glory to himself. But the way he brought glory to himself, he also emptied himself of all powers of deity in the person of Jesus Christ and then died for us on the cross of Calvary to redeem us back. That, he went from the omnipresent, omniscient, all-powerful God. And God became flesh, and the Word and the Jehovah flesh he became and dwelt among us and we beheld the glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and true, but yet fragile because he had a human body. A human body without sin, a human body that would never have died. But nonetheless, God created his son to die, capable of dying. We don't create our children to die. They do. But we don't do that on purpose. God created his son to die for us on purpose. Hodge says, the Bible constantly speaks of God as a causing the grass to grow, as being the real author or maker of all the air, the earth, and water product produce, and what water produces. Uh, as in Genesis 1, God is also elsewhere represented as creating by means of his spirit, Psalm 10 and 30, and by his powerful word, Psalm 148, verse 5. Now under Roman numeral number three. The theories that are opposed to the doctrine of creation. In spite of all the teaching of the Bible on the subject, there are many who reject the doctrine of creation and hold their own theories of the universe. Four of these anti-creation theories must be ex ex examined briefly. The, an the atheistic, the dualistic, and the pantheistic and the eternal creation theory. We know now that the universe is not eternal, which they taught, the scientists thought for a hundred years that the universe was eternal, but it is not. It had a starting place. The atheistic view. As we have already shown in chapter 4, this theory holds that the universe is the totality of existence. The atheists believe that the universe is the totality of existence. And now they have discovered that there are many galaxies out there in the universe. It's not. And then they say, oh, well, then there's got to be another Earth out there. There's got to be another Earth. And that proves that it, it, the Earth is eternal and that uh, we don't need a God to have created all this. This is all evolved. Surely out there in all these other galaxies and all these other solar systems that surely there is another earth and another process of evolution <clears throat> and that it exists necessarily from all eternity two, two principal theories of the beginning of the universe and the earth have been advanced that according to the nebular hypothesis the solar system started as a hot rotating gaseous spheroid of nebula cooled by radiation and consequently, uh, consequently shrank. The shrinking accelerated at the rate of the rotation and this in turn increased the equatorial bulge. This led to the separation of the equatorial ring which also cooled and contracted and this caused it to be disrupted and its substance to be gathered into a planet whose orbit lay in the plane the ring had occupied, or the road that the ring had occupied. But when the hypothesis was subjected to a critical testing at the opening of the 20th century, it was found to have so many faulty and fatal weaknesses that it was abandoned. According to the more popular planet test mill, Hypothesis, the Earth started as an independent career as a bolt of gas shot from the sun by the pull 
of a passing star in conjunction with the explosive forces of the sun. This, by outward momentum and pull of the star, gave the earth bolt an elliptical orbit around the sun, which in cooling condensed to a small central core and a vast number of planetismal planetismals. But we have already shown under the cosmological argument in chapter 3 that the universe is not eternal. It is not eternal. Now we look at all this. Now they have the Big Bang Theory, which I believe is right, except the Big Bang was when God spoke it into existence and it exploded forth from him. It was created from things not seen. But it all came from God. God, everything we see here today, the floor we walk on, everything God created immediately and immediately. That the universe is not eternal. Let us remind the reader once more that James Jean's statement, he said that the universe is running down. It is going downhill. They believe now... <coughs> that the universe is exploding apart and that when it reaches a certain point that it'll turn around and come back together and implode. The Bible kind of teaches that, that all things will be all in, in, in Him again. That's very beautiful. People are all the time thinking that the earth is going to explode. Some asteroid or planet is going to hit it or whatever they're always worried that it's something's going to happen 150 years from now not one person alive today will probably be alive in 150 years what are they worrying about but if they were alive in 150 years God is still in control of the order of all things the Bible says that a planet or a asteroid will strike the earth during the tribulation period. Calls it wormwood. I really believe that's going to happen. But it's not going to totally destroy the earth. It's going to poison the waters of the oceans. It's going to be catastrophic. But many things have been catastrophic in the days of the earth when Satan destroyed the earth in Genesis 1 and 2. As we look from Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah 14, it was a mess. And God put it back in order. His immediate creation. Immediately he created it, his immediate creation, and it was all good. And then it was destroyed, and then God, in his immediate creation, in reconstruction of it, he put it back together. Like our lives. We're all messed up, and then God puts us back together. But we're never completely, totally fixed until the resurrection. If the <coughs> universe is running down, that it's not self-sustaining and not self-propelled, it then it is not eternal. Furthermore, we have shown in a number of ways that there is a personal, extra-mundane, self-revealing God, and it has taught us that the universe is the work of his creative abilities. The universe was created by God. Why? To bring glory to himself. But he would become very humble before that happened, the first coming of Christ. The dualistic theory. Let us recall two types of dualism here. The one that holds that there are two self-existent principles, God and matter, and that both are eternal. Now here, who do we have, what religious society do we have that has this situation in, in their minds? She was a heretic, Mary Baker Eddy, Christian Science, which isn't Christian and is not science either one. This is this dualistic. All matter, by the way, according to her, is evil and uh, is, a, is a mirage. Only the spirit is eternal. Yes. That's why they, yes. they didn't believe Jesus came in a human yeah, body. That's right. It's a body and mm -hmm. defiled. Why would God, God defile himself and become human? 
God defiled himself and became human to redeem. And it wasn't that he didn't defile himself in doing it either because he was he pure. Humbled himself, he humbled himself and became human, John 114. Matter is, however, subordinate to God and an instrument of his will. The Alexandrian Gnostics, Basilides, and Valentinus held this view. In recent times, John Stuart Mill, F.W. Robertson, and James Partineau have held it, and Mary Baker Eddy. The theory was devised account for the existence of evil and to escape the difficulty of imagining a production without the use of pre-existing materials. Now, God did create the earth from himself. What we call ex nihilo is true, but it isn't true either. Out of nothing, it came out of God. And God is not nothing. The other that holds the two eternal antagonistic spirits, the one good and the other evil. <clears throat> On this view, matter is either the work or the instrument of an evil spirit. As I said with Mary Baker Eddy. The Manichans held this view. Manny, the founder, martyred in 276, taught a mixture of Christian doctrine with a Persian dualism of light and darkness. Satan was a product of darkness. The problem of evil is admittedly a difficult one, but as we have already said, the dualistic theories are not real solution to it. First of all, they make all they all make God finite. God is not finite. He is infinite. We are finite beings. God is infinite. But a finite God cannot satisfy the heart for what guarantees does such a God offer to the final triumph over the good. The final triumph of the good. Furthermore, a finite God contradicts our fundamental conviction that God is an absolute sovereign and that nothing is the independent of his will. Secondly, the maxim ex nihilo, nihil fet, out of nothing, nothing is made. Ex nihilo, nihil fit. out of nothing, nothing is made. Upon which the theory rests is a true only insofar as it asserts that nothing occurs without a cause. Nothing has been created without a cause. God creates because of a cause. God wants to dwell with the human race that he created. That whole tabernacle tells us that as we study the tabernacle in church history at this time. Nothing occurs without a cross. It is untrue if it is taken to mean that nothing can ever be produced except out of previously existing materials. Now, when you create something out of a previously existing material is what we call a what? Immediate creation. But God created the heavens and the earth out of pre-existing material in himself. It came from himself. It came from him. But it was created immediately from him. The doctrine of creation does not do away with the idea of cause, but it assigns to it a sufficient cause, God. Thirdly, as Strong points out, this theory does not answer its purpose of accounting for moral evil, unless it also assumes the spirit is material, in which cause or case dualism gives place to materialism. And finally, the theory is ignored the teaching of Scripture that God created the universe with all that he contains, and that he is absolutely sovereign in it. He is sovereign in it. He, what sovereignty mean? Total, absolute. He does what he wants to do. He created it, and he does what he wants to do with it. The pantheistic theory, on page 168. None of the pantheistic theories has any proper doctrine of creation holding that the universe is either an emanation from God, as did the Syrian Gnostics, or that it is but the manifold manifestation of the one eternal and self-existent being, as do most of the present-day pantheists. 
The pantheistic theories make God create necessarily, destroy the foundation of morals, make rational religion impossible, deny personal immora immortality, defy, deify man by making him a part of God, Herbert Armstrong, and Mormonism. You see that? And furnish no adequate explanation of a concrete reality. We have replied to these theories in the fourth chapter of this book and refer the reader to the things said therein. Number four, the bottom of page 168, the eternal creation theory, the eternal creation. This view is held by some who believe the personality and sovereignty of God. They believe in the personality and sovereignty of God. It is thought that the omnipotence, the timelessness, and the love of God demand such a theory. Origin in ancient times and Roth, Donor, Lotzi, Martinson, and Fidier in recent times have espoused this view. To this we reply that the omnipotence of God does not require the existence of all his power, the exercise of all his power. He may and he may not create and still be omnipotent, nor does God's timelessness require that his creation be free from the law of time, nor does his timelessness require that his creation be free from the law of time. God created the heavens and the earth in eternity past. In space and time, he put them back together. In space and time, God put man on this universe, in, this, in the universe on this earth. Strong says, rather it is true that no eternal creation is conceivable since this involves an infinite number. Time must have had a beginning. Time must have had a beginning, and since the universe and time are coexistence, creation could not have been from eternity. Creation could have not been from eternity because there was a, there was a punctiliar action, Barashith Bara. In one of the beginnings, he had created God, the heavens and the earth. In one of the beginnings, in eternity past. And that's when the universe began. But it is not in space and time today. But it is in a marked off piece of eternity past. Which we can't understand at all. That's old long. Ace Tony on Tony on. Nor does the immutability of God require that he always do the same thing. Nor yet does the love of God require an eternal object of love other than the several members of the Trinity. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten sin. God loved the world more than he did his son. Did he? Did God love the world more than he did his son? That he gave his only begotten son? That whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. For God so loved the world that he want desired, he designed to redeem the world back from through his son? that he would put his son through this accessibility to death, the son, taste of death. Himself. That's right. So That's why Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commands. If you love me, do as I did. If you love me, be a servant. Be like me. Boy, now that's hard to fathom, isn't it? That God, remember the four different flags around the tabernacle. The one was a ox. Jesus is our servant. He's our servant God. Yet he's our king. Yet he's God in flesh. And yet what? He's man. To redeem us, he was man. Since the theory robs God of freedom, it virtually turns into pantheism. The time of creation are you learning? I know this is deep stuff. Yeah, it, it, Are you learning? I'm learning what I don't know. Learning what we don't know. I remember Things I've never thought Brett of. Johnson came to my class. 
He, st- he was at Valley Baptist Church for years. He went to the Olive Drive Church. He was a member of the that church, that First Baptist Church of Bakersfield. His family were were in that church for a long time, since Lavender and all of that. And he had read the Bible 17 times, and he knew everything that a preacher was getting up and preaching. And he could say the next word that a preacher was going to say in his evangelistic messages and all of this. And, he, and Bill Hawkins invited him to come to my class. He said, come and listen to Dr. Jim preach. <clears throat> Well, I will. I'll go over there. I'll try to teach him something. So he came to my class. And I couldn't shut him up for about the first five times in the class, and they just got quiet. He got real quiet. After about six months, he came to me, and he said, You know what? I read the Bible all these times. I read all the blah, blah, blah. I don't know anything. I don't know anything. I just realized now I didn't know anything about God or the Bible at all, until now. And now I know that I don't know anything. But he's still learning. I don't know anything. I'm still learning. I'm still learning. The theories opposed to creation all hold that the universe is eternal. The two atheistic theories, however, hold that there has been a great process of development or evolution. The present character of the universe is by no means the original one. Because it's evolved. But even as Kant, Laplace, Herschel, originators and proponents of the nebular hypothesis do not seem to have any idea when the presupposed original nebula began to throw off the first of the series of rings of matter from which by cooling and contracting the plants and their satellite, the planets, I think he says plants, I think it means planets and their satellites, and the rest of the bodies of the solar system were formed. Went and Smith, holding to the the planetismal hypothesis, suggests that it was a billion, billion years ago. Then the enormous clouds of particles were thrown out from the sun in some terrific explosion, which gradually collected under the action of gravity into our planets. Winton Smith in their matter and energy. All geologists would probably hold that the present order of the universe is very old. The present condition of the universe is very old, and we have no problem with that except if you are a young Earth proponent. But you need to read your Bible because the Earth is not young. It's old. The Earth and heavens were created in eternity past. How long is eternity? A billion years? Ten billion years? A thousand years. What it is? We do not know when the earth was created, but we know it's old. People don't have to believe your... People don't have to believe that the earth is 6,000 years old to be born again. And that's what they're proposing today. If you don't believe that, then you're lost. You know, that's what the Bible teaches. But they know what the Bible teaches. That's why we're studying this class, so we know what the Bible teaches. So we can reach those atheists. As far as I know, my atheist stepfather, Dale Otto Randall, finally became a believer. He had one thing to say about his reckless, wild, outlaw life. One redeeming factor in all of it. He said, I raised Jimmy, which he did. That was his redeeming deal because of what I'm doing here. What I did then. And when I began, I told him he was in Jackson, uh, Michigan prison when I wrote him and told him that I believe that God wanted me to preach. He said, you better learn Greek and Hebrew because the Bible wasn't written in English. That was a discouragement. But I did. And I've never been sorry about that either. Even in his abusive ways to me, he encouraged me. But the believer in the Bible does not need to fear in the presence of the guesses of the geologist. We have been shown here that there is an ample room in Genesis' account of creation for all the geological formations that exist. We do know that. Are they real? Is this evidence? Yes, it's real evidence. 
I remember when uh, Bill and Cindy Paul came to my house. Cindy was is an is a scientist. She said, "I really have a lot of trouble believing this six thousand year old universe." I said, "Well, the six universe is not six thousand years old." And so I taught Genesis one and one and two that night. I had just beginning to begun to teach the Book of Genesis from the Hebrew text. She said, "Wow, we stayed up all that night talking to me. We stayed up all night." talking. She was so excited to see what the Bible really taught. Well, I knew something was wrong someplace. I knew something I, I know God is true. I know the Bible is true, but I couldn't figure it out because the earth is very old. It's not young. It's not a young earth. It isn't. It's not what the Bible teaches. If he accepts the so-called restitution hypothesis that there was a great catechism that changed the original creation into a state of chaos in verse number two, we ha aritz hatyatuhu vavu. That's what it says. The earth became. The earth she had become a formless and void chaos. Destructed. Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28 tell us that. Then he will trace the present character of the earth's surface to what the cataclysm or to a long period change between the events of verses 1 and 2. If he accepts this view that the six days are epochs and not ordinary days, then he will trace the developments to those six days. I believe those six days are real days, yom, 24-hour days. But that earth was, their heavens and the earth were created in eternity past a long time ago. And God begins his immediate creation to reconstruct the earth in Genesis 3, Genesis 1 and 3. In any case, he need not fear the facts of geology will ever be shown to be in conflict with the statements of Scripture. And now we have people that are just defying facts and telling you to put your head outside, your brain outside when you go to church and just believe in this stuff which is not realistic. It is not real. But it is a theory. One thing about the Bible, if you teach, if you study it in Greek and Hebrew, it will inoculate you from what we call theological fads, and this is the theological fad. The old theologians didn't believe that because most of them knew the Bible languages. In turning the biblical account itself for information on the time of creation, we note first that the date of 4004 B.C. found in the margins of some of the editions of the authorized version. What is the authorized version? Authorized version is King James Version. It was authorized by the Church of England. It's very tainted with their theological views. And I know I didn't mean to totally destroy your belief that the Bible, King James Bible, is inspired of God because it is not is inspired by King James and his 47 ex-Catholic priest, basically, Episcopalian priest, that translated the Bible, and he told them, don't you translate anything in there that's contrary to the belief of the Church of England. And by the way, the King James Bible was never supposed to be translated without the Apocrypha on payment of death. Study the origin of the King James Bible. Read the preface, the epistolatory preface, the epistolatory letter to it that denounces the Baptists and the Catholics in the beginning. I can say that, yeah, they denounced the Catholics. The Catholics didn't have a Bible. They didn't want one. But the Baptists did. And they said that they wouldn't believe anything that wasn't hammered out on their own Bible, which their own translations, but Baptists were still teaching in Greek and Hebrew still. For hundreds of years, Baptists had to know Greek and Hebrew. And they had to memorize four Gospels in Greek and at least the Psalms in Hebrew. This was quite a task for a preacher. I haven't done that. I've written all the four Gospels in Greek and all the New Testament letters in Greek from Matthew through Revelation. I've translated much of the Old Testament, but I still have a lot to do. If the Lord gives me a little more life, I might do a little more. But that's up to him, too. Some of the editions of the authorized version is Archbishop Usher's date. This is Usher's date. 
This is King James Day. According to the Septuagint, what year was Jesus born? According to the Septuagint. He was born in the seventh millennium from the creation. He was born at the seventh millennium at 7,000 years. We need to understand date settings are date settings. They are not facts. That's Usher, Archbishop Usher. It is no part of the inspired text and can at most be true only of the time of the creation of man at best. And that's not even true because the Septuagint translators believe that Jesus was born on the seventh millennium. Six, nine, three thousand nine hundred and ninety-nine years after the creation of Adam. That's the seventh millennium. It is not certain whether that is the exact date for the creation of man. And in the second place, we protest against the rendering of Genesis 1 and 1 in so-called American translation of the Bible, which is as follows. When God began to create the heavens and the earth, the earth was a desolate waste with darkness covering the abyss and the tempestuous wind raging over the surface of the waters. The Hebrew text does not warrant the twisting and resting of the initial prepositional phrase into a adverbial clause of time and it seems near blasphemy to translate the word ruah here by a temperature when ruah a spirit god we wish however to grant that the universe is much older than 6,000 years how much older perhaps no one can ever tell this side of heaven do you have any questions Right there is where we're going to quit. Questions. Questions. That's quite. <laughs> There's just so much. Um. You think. You begin to think when you study systematic theology. You begin to think. Don't put yourself into a theological straitjacket with time setting. How many times has the end of the world been predicted? In my lifetime, in 71 years, how many times has the end of the world been predicted? Too many. Who knows the, when the end of the world is going to be predicted? The Lord knows it. That's all, not us. We see a lot of things that are leading up to that. Now, we know that a lot of things have been fulfilled but the moment, the time, it would be ridiculous and blasphemous to say that we know. Our Heavenly Father, we come to you. We send this message out there for your honor and for your glory to build your people up. If someone is out there that they do not know you, that they will be saved because Jesus, our Savior and our God, became flesh to redeem us. He lived for 30 years. He began his ministry. And he died on the cross of Calvary for us. Father, I pray that those out there will realize that Jesus died for them, that he was raised for their justification, and that he ever lives to intercede for us, because we need it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. family.